Welcome. 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 Welcome to Community Baptist Church, where Christ is Lord and friends become family. Good evening. Welcome on this wonderful Wednesday evening as uh, we engage for our moment of Bible study. Um, first and foremost, in this Advent understanding, I want to uh, say God bless you. I pray that uh, the season is treating you well, um, that you are bundled up. There is a storm happening right now. And so I want to make sure that you are safe inside um, and that you have uh, made sure to make all your arrangements. This too shall pass. Um, and so as we pray that God continue to move um, in the area of a hedge of protection around us, um, we bless God for what he's doing. Um, and I look forward um, as we have a number of different things uh, taking place here at Community Baptist Church that I want to make sure that you are involved in. Uh, first and foremost, um, tis the season. That's right. Tis the season. On this Saturday, uh, I know that our women will be um, in their women's monthly experience um, for this Saturday. This will be the monthly women's breakfast virtually via Zoom. Make sure you log in and check that out. Uh, but on Sunday, look at somebody say Sunday. Yep, it's going down. Sunday, we have our Christmas cantata. We are excited. Like I told you on Sunday, there's going to be some oldies, but some goodies. We got some caroling, some hymns. At the same time that we have normal Sunday service at 11 a.m., um, we will also be with our understanding right there uh, for a virtual Christmas celebration um, as we culminate our experience um, with the final Sunday prior to the celebration of Christ's birth. So it's definitely something you don't want to miss. Um, I definitely want to shout out um, Director Carlos da Costa and all the work that he's done um, with this incredible ensemble. I want to thank all of my um, out-of-state additions to our presentations. You know who you are. All of our uh, folk who've been uh, sequestered, if you will, are back in it um, for this one wonderful experience. So make sure that you tune on in this Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, for our Christmas special. And, and in addition to that, coming up on Christmas Eve, that's right, Christmas Eve, we're going to have service once again, right before we celebrate Christ's birth. Um, trust me, I won't keep you long, um, but just to get us um, fully vested in the spirit so that when you wake up on Christmas morning, it should be a tide over from the wonderful worship experience that we had on Christmas Eve as we celebrate the great things that God has done um, by nature of the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, to us. Without further ado, we're back into our series on forgiveness. I know somebody asked me, said, Pastor, how long are we going to be in forgiveness? I said, when you forgive me. No, I'm just messing with you. For real. Um, it's just something that at this point, uh, I believe God has pressed on my heart that we as a church family and as a, a world, as a whole, as a nation, as a, as a people, uh, need to really embrace some of the concepts that God put on my heart uh, for us to understand in the essence of forgiveness. And as you know, um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been engaging and tipping our head into some uh, conversations with some spiritual characters who've given us some insight on what it is to have biblical forgiveness. This one in particular um, is close to my heart um, because I think that it speaks to just about everybody. Um, and I hope that it blesses you. Uh, so let us pray. Father God, we bless you. We thank you um, in this Advent season, God. We thank you uh, for your continued blessings upon us, God. We thank you uh, for being faithful to us, God. We thank you for bringing us to yet another Wednesday. Um, now, dear God, I ask that you anoint me for such a time as this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' matchless name we pray, amen. For this evening, I kind of want to take a look at two, two passages of scripture, if you can go with me, um, that kind of give me some parallels 
on what I would like to talk about on this evening. Um, the first one is in Psalms 51, um, 51st uh, of the Psalms. I'm going to read a few passages out of that one. Um, followed by that, I would like to take a look at the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. Um, so we'll start in Psalms and we'll go to Romans. Okay, Psalms 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make to me known wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors the ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Amen. All right. I, I caught a, a, a throwback spirit with that. I heard that song in there. Uphold me. I'm sorry. That Sometimes you got to have a song in your soul. But these are the songs that I grew up for. <laughs> Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Um, looking at that first verse. Watch. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for our sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay. Uh, just as a notion of recap, and I want to get to these scriptures right here that we just read. Um, we realize that the reason why forgiveness is so important is because we genuinely can't move into the next season of our lives uh, without forgiving. In other words, forgiveness in and of, in and of itself is the gateway uh, to what God has on the other side. And it's no mystery that we come to the apex, the closing of this season, um, as we get ready to move into a new year. I believe and I would contend that there are some things that God needs you to understand about forgiveness in order for you to be successful into the new revelation that he has on the other side. Because the truth of the matter is this, every day there is a reason, if you will, <laughs> for you to be offended. <laughs> As a matter of fact, somebody listening to me right now is offended. The truth is life is full of offense. And what we recognized in our last uh, studies was that the devil wants to be uh, uh, wants to allow you to remain in the place of offense. Because he realizes that if, in, in fact, you find yourself in the place of offense where you cannot forgive, um, there are a number of things that become a casualty as a result. Your relationships and partnerships with others become a casualty when you fail to forgive. Church can be a casualty if you fail to forgive. Folk offend you, folk rub you the wrong way. You can find yourself stuck in a place where you're unable to move, where you are hijacked by your emotional understanding. Forgiveness is difficult, but most importantly, forgiveness or unforgiveness at the very root of it, it hurts our relationship with God. 
it hurts our relationship with God so much so that that uh, we should forgive others. Because if you can't forgive others, Christ himself said, I find it hard to forgive you. And here, here's the question. What is worth the challenging place where my salvation becomes in jeopardy? What can you do to offend me so bad that I'm willing to put my salvation on the line? So forgiveness in and of itself, we realize, is absolutely necessary for our development, uh, not as just uh, on a Christian walk, but on our day to day experience as people. Now, we recall we talked about Paul and John Mark and their level of contention and how it forced the severing of that relationship and how ministry as a result could not continue the way that it had because of a lack or an inability to forgive. On last week, we took the look, look at Joseph and his brothers who found himself also in a situation of egregious offense. And there were some things that we realized that inside of Joseph's testimony um, forced us to the place where we must learn how to release. Because some things are hard to forgive. Just as a notion of recap, we remember um, some things are difficult to forgive. Forgiving repeat offenders, that's 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 challenging. Folk just keep doing it over and over and over again. That's 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 challenging to forgive. Um, forgiving folk um, who hurt your loved ones. That's challenging to forgive. Uh, you do what you want to do to me. But put your hands or your mouth or your understanding on my children. I may find it hard, hard to forgive. But what I would contend to be one of the most challenging pieces, especially when we come up on this season, is when you find it hard to forgive yourself. Yeah, no, no. I know somebody, they've been listening to the last couple of weeks. They told all their friends to tune in uh, so they can learn how to forgive the people who've done these mad, unimaginable things to them. And they said, girl, let me just tell you how we're going to get past. It. I love it. And then they showed up and said, wait a minute, what you talking about, Pastor? Yes, forgiving yourself is one of the hardest things to do. That's what I want to couch myself in on, on this evening. Uh, forgiving ourselves is challenging. The reason why I say during this season, this season during the Christmas time, is when you have the highest rate of suicide. People find themselves in places where they don't feel like living is worth it anymore. And oftentimes that area is from a place of guilt. And if you can't testify, that's okay. At least I know I can get two amens from at least Peter and David, who can give me some essence to understand what it's like when you find it challenging to forgive yourself. Now, I mean, we're talking about Peter, if you will. When you look at Romans, um, you find Peter there. This is Peter, the gospel globetrotter. You know, Peter, uh, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter. Um, walking on water, Peter, that's what Peter, y'all. But in Matthew 26, we find Peter weeping bitterly because, of course, as you know, Peter makes a grievous mistake and finds it hard to, to be in the presence of the other disciples. At this point, he, he's unconsolable, if you will. He, he doesn't want to be around the saints because of a level of unforgiveness that he has within himself. You ever been there when it's hard to look yourself in the mirror? Well, if not Peter, we look in Psalms and we look at our, our friend David. I'm talking about David. You know, David, man after God's own heart. Harp playing David. Goliath slaying David. Greatest king of Israel, David, arguably. David. Yes, David. Jesse's boy, David. So David finds himself also in this very place. In Psalm 51, he echoes the sediments of not being able to forgive himself. 
he's confronted in Second Samuel uh, chapter 12 by a prophet by the name of Nathan. And at this moment, when, when Nathan talks to him about his transgressions, the fact uh, that he committed adultery and now had Uriah killed, this he says, look, Dave, you, you, there's some stuff you need to get right. David lays out prostrate. He bring, begins to fast. It was interesting on Sunday school. We were talking about uh, ways and places that you fast. And sometimes it is in a place of, of repentance. But it said that no one could console David. He was wrought with pain and agony as he was mourning the separation that takes place when you can't forgive yourself. So both David and Peter had made a major mistake. Now, the wonderful thing about the virtual experience is you don't have to look at your neighbor. You can be honest wherever you are and say every last one of us has made a major mistake, has fallen short somewhere. Every last one of the, us can contend we're an area and place that we aren't even comfortable speaking about. Now, if, if you said that's not true, then we already know your major mistake is lying. Because we've all been there. There's some stuff that you can honestly say, that's just between me and God. There's some areas where I, like David and Peter, have made some mistakes. And some can even contend have made some mistakes that still haunt them today. You ever made a mistake that went with you wherever you went? Uh, Psalm 51 says it like this. My sin is ever before me. In other words, my my transgression, I can't escape it. And I can bear witness to somebody. Allow me to go ahead and be chief among sinners since uh, you can't say amen. I can. Your conscience can wear you out. You ever been in a place where some transgression that you had either threatened some opportunity you were or threatened a relationship and you didn't know how to reconcile it? Well, maybe it's a place where you told God, I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to do this again. And you found yourself right back there. You feel the weight of guilt. I want to say something on the onset of this so that you can hear me at, at the end. The weight of guilt is never the hand of God. I need you to hear that again. The weight of guilt, it's never the hand of God. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, a story um, of a guy named um, Kevin Tennille. I think it was around, uh, it might have been about 82. And seeing as that's when I was born, I clearly wasn't alive for <laughs> was it conscious for this story. But um, when I read about it, it, it blew my mind. Uh, I'll just give you the cliff notes. You can read about it in your free time. Kevin Tennille was, um, and uh, and I believe he was 17 years old, um, and uh, he had been out, had a few drinks, um, and decided to get into a car and drive. He got into a car and struck an 18-year-old girl, taking her life. He was charged with uh, manslaughter and drunk driving. And after doing some time in jail, um, he came out and, and the family actually uh, went and pursued a civil suit for $1.5 million. So the family wins the civil suit but ended up settling with the courts for $936. Now, someone's got to be asking a question, how'd they win the suit, but then would settle in the court for $936? Well, what happened was the family decided that what they really wanted from Kevin, they wanted him every Friday to send a check for $1 to the family and remi to remind him of what happened every day, every, every Friday for 18 years. For 18 years, he had to write a check for $1 to send to the family so that he would never forget 
what he did. Now, 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 Kevin tried to write a bunch of ch checks at once, and they took him back to court. And said, "No, no, 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 no. You, you gonna remember this? Every Friday for 18 years, I want you to consciously write and send a check to this family to remind you of what you took from us." trying to escape it, but a consistent reminder of what happened. You know what you're saying? Why are you telling that story? Because that's the way the enemy works in your life. The work of the enemy is condemnation through guilt. So that every time that you try and get past something, the enemy wants to remind you what you did, and therefore what you are not worthy of. Now, make no mistake, at this point, um, I, I recognize that there is a notion, um, and some of us have been dealing with this as we speak, that there has been something that the devil has tried to remind you of that God has forgiven you of. See, when Peter denies, uh, he knows uh, he knows that, that there's an issue with what took place. If you take a look at... Um, Luke chapter 22, when you look at Peter in this guilt and shame essence, um, the interesting piece is that Christ knew Peter was going to deny him. But in Luke tap, chapter 22, is when you read it in your free time, the awesome piece is that Christ tells him he's going to deny him. And then also in the same conversation tells him what to do when you get right. He said, listen, you're going to do it. And then when you do it, this is what I need you to do. He said, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm not going to. No, no, no. no I, I know what you're going to do. So there's good news in that. You know what the good news is? On the onset, the good news is this. Um, your mistakes are not a surprise to God. You, you, you didn't surprise God by nature of your mistakes. He, 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 he knows that you are going to mess up. He knows that you're not perfect. He knows that you're going to fall short. You, you, you can't surprise God with your mistakes. But the, uh, the great point about it is that just like in this text, when you look at how Jesus treats Peter, uh, he says, listen, not only do I know you're going to mess up, but I'm also providing you a way to get back. That, that, that's good news for us in the midst of an area where we find it hard to, quote unquote, forgive ourselves. See, after you've fallen, there's two roads that you can take. One of them is shaped by Satan, and the other one is graced by God. Okay, the one that's shaped by Satan is, is, is filled with guilt and condemnation. The one that's graced by God is... Uh, uh, it's filled with reconciliation and conviction and grace. So we look at Romans 8, chapter 1, verse 1, and this is the awesome piece of this entire pericope. There is, read it, no condem condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You know what? Read that to yourself. I need you to hear that in your own spirit. There is no, no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That condemnation and guilt is not an inevitable outcome of a situation. It's a choice. A.W. Tozer, the wonderful theologian, um, wrote this piece and makes this wonderful statement. He says, guilt is a prison with no bars. Yeah. Guilt is a prison with no bars. In other words, you choose to stay there. There's two realities that David and Peter teaches us. The first one is that you can be fully forgiven by the Father. That, that ought to set somebody free right there. Let's go back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 Verse number three, it says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. But then we get to four. against thee and thee alone have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. OK, anybody else got kind of confused when we got to four? Y'all remember what, what David did? David has committed adultery and then in turn 
set up the husband, pretty much committed murder with Uriah. And then we ride on, y'all with me? Verse number four, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Hold up, David. Um, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I was, I was upset by that. And then God blessed me with this. He said, listen, Jamie, what you got to understand is your sin may affect others, but your sin is always against God. I hear what I said. My sin may affect other people, but the sin is a transgression against God. See, now I know what you're asking. Well, what are you trying to prove here? Because the devil tries to convince us, us that God is not offended or involved uh, if no one else is hurt. Our sin is always against God. It's not to take away the effect that it had on others, but in places even when others aren't affected, you still sinned against God. Let me see if I can give you an example. Um, Y'all two grown consenting adults. Nobody was hurt. No, 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 no. Your sin was against God. Because the devil wants to take God out of the equation. That's why so many people have struggled with forgiving themselves. Because uh, forgiveness is a contract between the offended and the offender. In which case, uh, the offended gets to release the offender from whatever debt was incurred by the offense. And so uh, the crazy thing is uh, when you when you're in a place where you're you're seeking forgiveness, um, you can't all of a sudden become the offended, which means technically you can't forgive yourself. You can't forgive yourself because your offense doesn't make you the offended. It makes you the offender. Who's the offended? The offended is God. So you're asking the question, why I can't forgive myself? Because you can't. Because you offended God. You can't get right with yourself until you get right with God. That's how this works. It's, it's, it's interconnected. In Psalms 51, 5 and 6, you know, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me known to wisdom. Purge me with his sub. I got to get right with God. See, I'm trying to feel better about it. And I'm asking God to help me feel better about it. He's saying, I need you to get right with me, not look at it from the other perspective. You saying I can't forgive myself. No, it's not for you to forgive yourself. Amen. This is this is why you get caught up on on the linguistic side of this doing. I need God to do in me what I can't do for myself. God forgives. The awesome piece about it is that no matter what you've done, God can forgive it. No, no, no matter. I know somebody saying, Pastor, here's the thing. Um, I ain't been to your office. If I told you half the stuff, no matter what you've done, God can forgive it. But you, you really don't know. Mm -mm, no matter what you've done, God can forgive it. Y'all, this is Bible study. I don't want I get Baptist on you real quick. The reason why I know is it was a Friday evening on a hill called Calvary. They nailed all of your sins, the ones that you committed and the ones that you're getting ready to on the cross. And that day he died for all of them. I can't get excited, Eric. Let me calm down. Um, whatever it is. And that's why one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 5 and 20. You ain't got to turn to it. I'll tell you what it says. Wherever sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. That, that's one of my favorites. So whether, whatever, whatever has happened, whatever's taken place, whatever's transgressed is not greater than the amount of grace that God has. In other words, I can't out -sin God's grace if I confess it. That's good. That I'm sorry. That's good. <laughs> There's no amount of understanding that sin can overrule the repentant heart that grace will cover. That's why you got to read your Bible. 
Because guilt is a feeling. Forgiveness is a fact. You need some scripture, don't you? I got you. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us for sins, for all of our unrighteousness. Romans 5 and 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if anyone be in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. John 8 and 36, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hear what the Lord says. I can give it, but you got to make a choice to receive it. How do you do that? It's simple. When you make a decision, you have to not just confess your sins. You also got to confess your forgiveness. You got to declare to yourself, I am forgiven. You know, uh, Elder Mike um, is, is the elder of worship. And um, we often talk um, with uh, Director Carlos um, and we try and discuss the 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 songs that we want to use and, and, and things that we want uh, to be involved uh, in worship um, as God puts on our heart to do so. And even when we got to the, uh, the Christmas songs, we said we really want some of the older, uh, you know, the, the traditional Christmas songs. I know there's a lot of new contemporary stuff out. But we wanted some of that as well. And um, it was really reminiscent for me because uh, you, you got to have uh, a spirit about you that has an appreciation for some of the older hymns. Some of the older hymns really give you some grounding on how to encourage yourself. See, sometimes it's okay to talk to yourself as long as you don't talk back. See, the thing is, you, you got to be able to declare <laughs> some things within you that you know. Uh, you you got to have a good him, I think the hymn writers wrote, uh, you got to know, come thou fount of every blessing. Jesus sought me uh, when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger and impose his precious blood. You, you got to have a little bit of Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it. Why doesn't it? Ask snow. You know, it's funny. When I was younger, they sang that song so quickly um, that I didn't really hear the lyrics and I got the lyrics a little twisted. This is, <laughs> I said, oh, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And instead of saying sin has left the crimson stain, I used to say Satan and left the premises. I don't know why it sounded like that. Satan left the premises. But what they were saying was sin and left a crimson stain. Y'all don't judge me. I, the point is, you got to know these older hymns that really give you some grounding and some basis. Or maybe there is a fountain full of blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. You got to be able to confess your forgiveness. Or I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me safe. You got to confess that you are forgiven by God. That, that's important because the encouraging that you have in yourself will allow you to have a spirit which can transcend what the devil will try and impose on you from the nature of guilt. Okay, and this is it. Finally, I'm, I'm done. Uh, finally, your failures aren't fatal or final. No matter what your mistake has been, God has a plan and a purpose for your tomorrow. Okay, let me see how I can prove it. Remember what Peter's done. Peter's denied Jesus three times. Then, oh, of course, Christ says, go tell uh, <laughs> the disciples and Peter <laughs> to come on. Come on back. So he's in the upper room. Here he is in the upper room. And when we see Jesus show up, we do not see him address Peter's sin. It's not written in scripture that he addressed Peter's sin. He walks up to him and breathes the Holy Spirit on him and says, now go preach the gospel. Nowhere after the Gospels is Jesus, is, uh, has Jesus seen being identifying Peter as the one who denied Jesus. 
Peter isn't called the one who denied Jesus. So I guess what I'm trying to explain to you is don't identify yourself by what you did. Identify yourself by who you are. My name is not my mistake. My name is redeemed. My name is forgiven. My, my name is washed clean. When I begin to declare these things over my life, I'm able then in turn uh, to have a new dispensation on the essence of what God is doing in my life. I'm not subject solely to who and the mistakes I've made in my past. I am completely embodying the not yet that God is bringing me to. I have a future and God has a purpose and a plan for my life. And that's why I, I, I'm careful. You can't just call me anything. You will call me redeemed. I'm reminded. And I, I close this um, for all my 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 boxing fans. Uh, Y'all, you know, I have to have a reference with, with something that will hopefully hit home. Um, everyone knows and has heard of uh, Muhammad Ali. And there was the wonderful match between him and uh, childhood friend Ernie Terrell. They grew up together, so they've known each other for years, and they get ready uh, to have their match. The interesting piece was at this point, uh, Muhammad Ali had recently converted to Islam and changed his name from Cassius Clay. Now, Ernie knew him as Cassius. That's, that, that's, that's Cassius. Mama called him Clay, I'm going to call him Clay. That, that was where Ernie was. And it got, it made, made Muhammad Ali a little upset. So they, you can go Google it, when they got into this match, um, and Muhammad Ali began to wear on him, he would lean back and hit him, what's my name? He leaned back again, <laughs> hit him, what's my name? You're going to get my name right. You're going to call me what I am now. You're not going to call me what I used to be. I say that to say this. Um, whenever the devil tries to place you in a position um, to force you to be subject to your past that God has already delivered you from, uh, you need to have a spiritual understanding that can look the devil in the eye and say, what's my name? My name is redeemed. My name is born again. My name is washed clean. My name is more than a conqueror. My name is above and not beneath. My name is lender, not bar. I, I don't stand in the essence of what I used to be. Uh, you telling what I used to be doesn't really faze me because that's not who I am right now. I'm uh, declaring and decreeing that somebody in this season, what I really want you to get into your spirit is forgiving yourself. And like I said before, you actually can't forgive yourself, but accepting the forgiveness that Christ gave by nature of saying that there is no condemnation and that he always has a purpose and a plan for your life. That's, that's what I got for us tonight. Um, next week, um, we're not going to do Bible study next week because, like I said, we have uh, the uh, Christmas Eve service, the Christmas Eve service. So we'll be in our Christmas Eve experience um, on that Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, Christmas Eve on Thursday. Um, so that's that's where we'll be for that. In a sense. And then uh, when we get back the following week, I'm going to try and close out this uh, session on forgiveness. And um, prayerfully, God will bring us to an apex. Um, and definitely write in the comments if you get something from this, if this is blessing you, um, If definitely feel free to share. Um, and definitely, I hope it encourages somebody along the way. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the sacrifice made on the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness uh, that is embedded in our ability to recognize who you are. We thank you for his blood and we accept that gift of forgiveness. God, I thank you for releasing us from the shackles of guilt and shame, dear Heavenly Father, knowing that uh, in you there is no condemnation and that there is a purpose and a plan for our lives. So God, as we walk forward by faith uh, from this moment, dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you lift the weight that has been placed on those who have found themselves racked with guilt, dear Heavenly Father, that you will bring them to the place uh, of confession, dear Heavenly Father, but ultimately the acceptance of you forgiving them um, and all of their unrighteousness, dear God. God, allow them to not feel alone, recognizing that we all walk this way at some point. God, give us the strength to lean on one another and to build one another up. 
God, I ask that you keep everyone safe on this evening, dear God, as the wind blows and the snow falls, dear Heavenly Father, that you will keep them uh, safe in their homes, dear Heavenly Father, that you will camp your hedge of protection around them, dear God, and all those who have to be on the roads, whether they be uh, essential workers, etc., that you will um, keep them safe as well, dear Heavenly Father, and bring them to their destination as soon as possible, dear Heavenly Father. God, I lift up those who are who find themselves homeless on this evening, dear God, um, in the cold, dear Heavenly Father, that you will provide and show shelter, dear Heavenly Father, in the midst of what's going on dear God. I also ask for a special prayer over our nation, dear God, as we uh, begin to uh, move into an essence of remedying uh, this pandemic, dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you have your hand on every physician, every worker, um, every person, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. We claim victory and understand that it's only because of you that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and good night.